<laughs> Hello everyone at home. Welcome internet people, Bips. <laughs> Haven't said that in a while. <laughs> Today we are joined by a special guest, Ivica Kovac. Have I said the surname? Perfectly, well done. Ivica Kovac. <laughs> Um, we're going to get into Avitsa's story and what he does a little bit later on. But Avitsa, you're very welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Honour to have you with us today. And we're mixing things up a little bit because we're exposing people more and more into some of the ministries of the church that we have here in the Archdiocese of Sydney. And so Avitsa plays a very special part, very strong part in that. And we're going to get into that a little bit later on. Spiritual son, how are you today? I'm going great. Good. Fired up. How are you? Good. How was your social calendar this week? <laughs> it was pretty good. Yeah. I had a wedding yesterday. <laughs> so Other can, than that, it, it was pretty quiet. It continues to be busy. Oh, no, it was all right. It was all right this week. Good. Catch up yeah. on some sleep. I'm learning to say no. It's good. good. Uh, catching up on some sleep. Uh, barely. barely. I've been watching the Touch Football World Cup in England, so I've been staying up for it. Okay. Yeah. Lebanon won the bronze medal. Beautiful. Decent. Wonderful. What an accolade. <laughs> They're all just Aussies. <laughs> <laughs> Lebanese national it. team won a bronze medal for touch football. World Cup. That's up there. Mm -hmm. That is up there. So not we've bad. got that happening and you're not <laughs> going to catch up on any sleep because the Olympics are about to start. Oh, I can't wait. So that's going to be massive too. Can't wait. And we'll have a bit to say about the Olympics the next few weeks, mm. which will be good. The Wizards with us. Hello. As always. <laughs> good, good. Actually, I heard some interesting news um, yesterday. There was a wedding mm. and there was a priest and a young man watching the footy at the table. There was. Mm. Now, listen. Very now listen. Very disappointing. Now listen. Now when I go to weddings, I don't I don't put the footy on my phone. I don't sit and watch like I don't I don't do that. Not on my phone. Okay. <laughs> I don't want to be the one to do it. But Father Ronnie <laughs> <laughs> He's called him I'm, out. I'm naming and shaming him. He's him I'm out. naming and shaming him. <laughs> Because he did it so publicly, yeah, he he put the footy on his phone and he put it up on like, like on top of cups and like leaning on like it was up there so for that everyone people to could see. Watch with him, yes. So that's not selfish at all. No, and and I was and I was just I happened to be sitting, you know, on it was the in table. Your line of sight, yeah, and it was in my line of sight. Beautiful. Well, we just got a, a text message complaint from the bride. Thanks, she's heartbroken. <laughs> she's heartbroken. <laughs> Why not the was groom? He, was he the priest? The groom was watching as well. <laughs> <laughs> did he did he conduct the the wedding? Father, Father Ronnie, Ronnie was uh, uh, he he can celebrated it. He it can was celebrated. Yeah, it was a Maronite. Oh, wonderful! Wedding. And he got to the reception, and then to celebrate with the bride and groom, he put the footy on. Are your best father? Best. <laughs> 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 he'll he'll have right hey. of reply. He'll hey. have right of reply. <laughs> I'm scared of it. That's good. That's good. So already you're seeing the weird tangents we go on in this show. Um, oh gosh! But Anthony, please, we've got a show sponsor. Yes, yes. So <laughs> as always, we do uh, we do want to thank uh, MJ Podiatry who, just to remind everyone at home, is a mobile home visit network servicing all throughout Sydney. They're an all-round podiatry service. Um, they give general treatments, anything for sport as well, and NDIS and home care packaging are offered as well. For any pains, injuries, custom-made orthotics, advice on footwear, anything you need, um, as I always say, MJ Podiatry not only has your back, but he's got your feet too. So, <laughs> so um Please do contact uh, MJ Podiatry. You can visit their website firstly at mjpodiatry.com.au or you can contact them at 0412 389 278 or email them at info at mjpodiatry.com.au. Don't forget the ATG10 promo code for 10% off. 10% for your 10 digits. Your 10 dogs, as I hear they're called these days. People dogs. are calling toes dogs. I thought that was your feet. You're pronouncing it wrong though. What are, they, what are they called? You're leaving out the G. The W, sorry. Dogs. 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 <laughs> you ten dogs. This is very strange. I don't know. <laughs> it's what weird. <laughs> Apparently, it's this whole social media trend. They're calling toes dogs. <laughs> so, there you go. I got it right. Anyway, MJ <laughs> Podiatry. Enough very, about feet. Speak, speak to MJ Podiatry about <laughs> yeah, it. I don't want to know about they're the, it. They're the experts on feet. <laughs> we'll leave it to them. Brief announcement. We love getting behind local events that are coming up. Um, the Family Educator Network for the Aerotropolis Network out west um, are holding, I think it's their inaugural, Dad's Rock evening at Club Marconi, which is on the 19th of August, and that'll be up 
on the screen now as I'm speaking. It's happening from 6.45 to 8.30 p.m. There'll be music, there'll be food, there'll be prizes, and then the lineup of speakers they have is absolutely amazing, two of whom have been on this show. We're very proud to announce Shabel Reish, the owner of Perusia Media, and Tomislav Ushkok. Did I say that right? Did I get that wrong? You don't have to put the sh in that one. Us. Uskok. Uskok. There we go. Okay. Ooh. So Tomislav Uskok um, <laughs> for MacArthur FC. We've had him on the show. Check it out. We'll put the link in the description. Um, great lineup of speakers. And then, of course, his father, Ronnie Marie. So um, <laughs> it's going to be hey, hey, an hey. absolute. Father Ronnie is an amazing speaker. It's going to be. <laughs> it's going to be an amazing evening. And we encourage men in that area, fathers of all ages, to get to that. Um, dads, uncles, grandfathers, fathers to be. Always good. Get out to it. Um, and I'm glad an event like this is being put on, as Avitsa will um, testify to. Um, fatherhood, masculinities, copped a bit of a beating um, in the culture as we have progressed the last, I don't know how many decades, but it's copped a bit of a beating. So I think it's making a very healthy revival. And we want those interested to get out to the Dad's Rock um, evening put on by the family educators out there. So that's a great initiative. Let's get into it. Avitza, thank you again for, for coming on. Um, we'll get into a lot of your ministry and, uh, and your greater vocation uh, as we go on. But we'd just like to know, firstly, my, myself, I myself would like to know, and, and for the listeners and viewers, a little bit more about who you are, your upbringing, your family life, faith life. Yeah, I'm a 1977 model, October 25. There you go. <laughs> um, the classics are always the best. <laughs> that's right. Um, I have one older sister, Sylvia, who's three years older than me. My father came out by boat um, in late 1969. and Back then they were on the boats, I think, for about a month and a half. So he came out, classic story, for a better life. Um, it was at a time of communism. Um, so for the Croatian people back then in Yugoslavia, if you were a family of faith, there wasn't much opportunity. Um, and like many tens of thousands, he, he left and he had one uncle here, so he came out by boat. Um, I'll just fast forward. He wanted to get married, but there was more Croatian men than women here because they came out to work. So he, he wrote a letter to his mother, my grandmother, and said, can you sort of point me in the right direction and she sent him a letter back gave him the details and he started writing to my mother so they'd never met and through letter writing over a couple of years um, when she turned 18 he popped a question over the letter wow and in 1973 she got on a plane and came over wow. and um, they married and they've been married now for 50 this is the 51st year wow so um that's that's the love story um letters that's letters awesome. yeah i wish i could read <laughs> maybe <laughs> maybe better than i did. <laughs> didn't i don't know <laughs> um, yeah and we'll get into letters because my wife wrote me letters but that was yeah. different yes <laughs> um so yeah my upbringing was what we say very cultural um in the croatian catholic community um it was very simple we went to sunday mass um and I, I can talk about that later, but we didn't pray the rosary at home. So the first time I prayed the rosary, I was, I was probably pretty much 30 years old. Never prayed at school, never prayed, didn't know how to pray. I knew the prayers as such, but didn't know the formula or how. Um, but a beautiful upbringing. We didn't have much, but but life was, life was good. It was simple. And I remember my parents giving me, <laughs> being who they were when they come from, I was the boy, so I was seen as the leader as such. So they would go to work early and a, a five-year-old, I was given the key to the house, not my eight-year-old sister. <laughs> and we we get up in the morning, have breakfast, get ready for school, get dressed, all of it. And I'd lock the house up and we'd walk to school and would come home and my parents still weren't home. And I was the one who had the key to the house. <laughs> it's just funny. Amazing, amazing. <laughs> what an honour, five years old. <laughs> yeah. What a and, responsibility. Yeah. <laughs> and I hear some parents, I'm not giving the key to my 20-year-old or yeah, you know, yeah. you'll lose it. <laughs> that happens, that happens. Whereabouts in Sydney did you grow up? 
Barella. Um, Barella. Yeah, as I oh, share wow. with people, I wasn't born in Australia. I was born in Auburn. <laughs> 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 Uh, yes. <laughs> Sounds about right. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I love it. So, at five years old, you're given a great responsibility. I suppose we're not as concerned back then with security as we are today, mm. but still, that's a big responsibility. It is. And, and that, what that led to was so the mail that would come, my parents would often not understand it. So again, who was the one who was meant to interpret and read this? It was me. I was reading about insurance and policy. <laughs> I had no idea. But when I look back, um, up against some of my peers, not up against, but in comparison to some of my peers, I was given this responsibility. And I was annoyed at the time, thinking, Far out. but I look back now and I go, wow, what preparation. So I knew how to sort out insurance by the time I was <laughs> <laughs> 10 years old <laughs> and some other things and yeah that's awesome good stuff <laughs> and so school life where'd you go to school yeah St. Peter Chanel up the road in Barella Regents Park uh, where now we have the lovely um, Dominican sisters of St. Cecilia and adjoined to that is Trinity um, back when I went it was Benedict's Benedict Marist um, in Auburn, and that was yeah. I have fond memories, great memories. The late Father Kings, there, um, they yeah, loved Saint Peter Chanel, and we were excited because at Year Four the boys left, and you went to Benedict Junior Year Five and Six, just boys, and it was like to prepare you for high school, and um, love the Morris brothers, brother Flavian. I just remember them all. We they really did mold us into to being men. It was such a step up from. Year four to year five. Um, yeah, I share that with my kids often. Um, and it's where today St. Joachim's is, the the parish office and, and the car park. We used to play cricket there. We used to play soccer with a um, tennis ball and there was broken toes and all sorts of things, <laughs> but it was fun. <laughs> <laughs> broken broken bones, broken toes, <laughs> MJ Podiatry. Um, <laughs> um, uh, yeah, and it's fun. You love to <laughs> you love to hear that. Uh, just just on that, did you play sports like competitively growing up? Yeah, soccer. Soccer was my thing. Um, not so much league. I played cricket at the park and in the schoolyard. Played soccer most probably for twenty five seasons straight, um, and then did a bit of over thirty fives. And then I realised it's time to now watch my kids. Um, but yeah, love love the game. I played. Um, locally, and then I played in the what you'd call the the MPL, so the the semi pro, the the third tier of the the state league. Um, there's different wow. terminologies yeah. now, <laughs> so I, I played in that for a few years, and then went back and played with my mates at all age St John's in Auburn, which um, also I think might have been founded by the Maris, but it was certainly founded by Catholics in that area. Um, so, yeah, I love the game, mateship, um, and I've got a story of how I, I met my wife sort of through sport as well. So, yeah. Ooh, okay. We'll, we'll get to that in a bit. But um, but you mentioned you, you as a family, you guys went to Mass on Sunday. Weren't sure about – like you, you didn't know the formula of praying the rosary and things. So was that sort of just an obligation thing, just going to Mass on Sunday? Yeah, so I went to Mass. It was in the Croatian language. So um, – but to be fair, I was going to say I didn't understand too much. I did understand, but I understood it as much as I understood the Mass in English. So my first language of prayer just naturally was Croatian. Um, not by choice, just by hearing the Our Father and the Hail Mary. But there was no ever talk, no sort of formation about the faith in any way. Um, certainly not at home. And no criticism of my parents. They... They gave me the love and and they gave me what they could. Mm. But just, yeah, absolutely, I'll be blunt, zero formation. Zero formation. And I felt that way even when I left school. Um, there's a lot of talk about schools, but I feel like the formation today in schools is a lot better from a Catholic perspective than it was when I went. Mm. That's my take on it, seeing what I went through and seeing my children. Which is interesting. 
Well, yeah. I would agree with that. And it, isn't it It's rather profound when you think about the way our parents raised us and they weren't, we had Dr. Robert Haddad on the show last week. They weren't apologists. Mm -hmm. There wasn't a, a deep understanding of what everything meant, but it was because of their beautiful faith that they may not have been able to explain that produced us. Mm. And then based on those foundations, we then went on our own journeys. And we know now in the culture that we live in, you can't just have a simple faith anymore. If you're on the front lines, you need to be able to understand what you believe and articulate what you believe. So it's rather profound to, to see the way God worked in all of that Yep. There's a whole generation of people that just had a, a beautiful faith that then took us to Mass on Sundays and we may not have understood everything, but look at where that's brought us to this point now. And I think, yeah, just on that, like reflecting back, I guess God knew what was needed and what I did know, which is, wow, I knew my parents loved each other in all their flaws and that they loved me. That I did know. Um, and I remember early on, I, I, this is, you know how you have these weird, odd memories from your younger years? I was seven or eight and it was um, Christmas and my dad sort of made a comment that he couldn't afford too much. You know, we didn't have excess money. But I remember him buying one gift for my sister and myself. And I remember we were being, we were just so joyful. We were so happy. It wasn't like we were going, oh, no. And it was just this little, I can't even say keyboard, this really small keyboard thing. And I don't know why that stuck with me, but in a in a really positive, beautiful way. Um, so I think that's what, that I, I'm saying there was no formation, but maybe the formation was really strong and what were, what was needed for the day. Yeah, yeah I think, because that, that's the foundation, right? Like the foundation of our life is... Uh, we speak about it so much and that it sometimes can become numb, but the foundation of our life is the love that, well, the love of God. And that's shown to us ideally through our parents. Yeah. And so that that's like the foundation stone is to understand that your parents love you makes it love. Yeah. Your parents love you <laughs> makes it easier to understand that there's a, there's a father, a heavenly father who loves us. Um, so that, yeah, that's powerful to just hear in, in practice, I guess, which is awesome. Yeah, yeah. It was a lived experience and, yeah. and it certainly wasn't perfect. There was flaws, but um, but still very beautiful. Awesome. And and what came first? So I know you're, you're, you're married with kids and you're obviously a, a very heavily, uh, for lack of a better word, a heavily, heavily practicing <laughs> Catholic. <laughs> certainly heavy. Uh, <laughs> And practicing, so yeah. <laughs> not at all. That is not how I intended it. <laughs> um, I'm deeply offended. <laughs> I'll just see myself off now. <laughs> um, no. um, what what came first? Your um, uh, the deepening of your faith, or or meeting your your wife, finding your vocation? Yeah, certainly it was certainly in marriage. Yeah. Um, so later. Um, the way I share it most probably is I'm a bit of a fertility, fertility revert. Um, so my my years, I fell away from going to Mass and 17, 18, 19, went through my rebellious years. Um, I wasn't, I can't talk up, that was I was an overly bad kid, but I just, and I wasn't anti-God, but I wasn't practicing my faith. And that was just distant. I was more interested in, in going out, partying, I, I would come back at five, six in the morning and wasn't going to mass. And my parents were, geez, very patient. Um, my dad would have a go <laughs> at me very often. Um, and I, I remember that sense of guilt, but I just did, I just kept doing what I did. And um, it, my wife has played a huge part in this. Um, similar upbringing to me. Um, similar story with her parents coming out. We never knew each other growing up. And the part of sport where I said we met was that <laughs> it's, this is, I laugh. So my now, her older sister and her now husband, 
my brother-in-law. So I knew him from growing up and he was saying to me about my wife, Maria likes you. And they, they come up with this plan. And her older sister who was dating him at the time said, you know, Ivica likes you. They just made it up. <laughs> I never noticed this young lady. And then when someone keeps telling you that, you sort of get a bit nervous and you start looking over. And she started coming to watch me play soccer with the team. And, but I'm thinking, she likes me. And that's, that's how I asked her out. They brought attention to it. And we both <laughs> met thinking the same thing. Until so later we realised, oh. How good is that? That's so awesome. I hear you like me. Yeah. <laughs> Let's go out. No, I hear you like me. <laughs> did you like me first or did I like him? Yeah. <laughs> That's great. Oh what a gosh. setup. That's awesome. It worked. They're married. We're married. Amazing. That's awesome. Um, but that. just, yeah, with the faith. So um, got married. I was 24, my wife was 23. Um, she was, funnily enough, also not born in Australia. She was born in Auburn a year, <laughs> earlier, a year later, should I say. And um, again, I thought when it was time to have kids that it just happens. That I really, it might sound so simplistic to people out there listening, but that's what I thought. Mm -hmm. And the point came where, hey, let's have children and it didn't happen. And a month goes and a few months and six months and a year and more. And then you start asking the serious questions. And there's a heavy burden, I think, on, on females when it comes to fertility. Um, us guys, absolutely, we care. But we're more flatline. So it was to fast forward after a long period of time and a lot of tests and whatnot, I still remember it vividly sitting like this at a desk and my wife next to me and the doctor saying that, we will never have children naturally, ever. After all the tests, they gave the reasons. My wife's got pox and irregular cycle and I've got slow sperm and low count, all this sort of thing. Sorry. Yes. How long have you been married at this stage? About three, uh, two and a half, th yeah, two and a half to three years. So you're trying? Yes. Okay. Yeah, and all around us, everyone's having children. And if, like, why, why not us? Um, so it was the first time leaving that doctor's surgery that I was my, I'll say, prayer from the depth of my heart. And it was, God, if you give me children, I will do whatever you want. And he's never, ever, to this day, <laughs> let me forget that prayer. <laughs> um, but that was my journey of coming back to the faith. And that wow. was my first, I think, cry out to God. What changes in you and your wife as you're hearing those words from the doctor? Did you go home that day deflated? Were you both thinking to yourself, we still have hope? What's going through when you're getting that? Well, for us, and I can't explain, I can only, by the grace of God, it must be, we both thought the same thing. And it was like, not in defiance, but this can't be all true. And we both wanted to turn to God. Um, it was much slower for me, but in that desperation, I wanted. I I cried out to God for help. Um, she went, I would say, deeper. She started to attend a women's prayer group and started praying more intentionally. But the thing is, our response was the same. In our output, it maybe looked different, but I don't know why because I didn't have this basis. I didn't know what the church taught on any of this stuff at all about fertility and never heard of natural family planning, um, didn't know what the church thought on IVF, contraception, nothing, zero. I, I never had thought about it. Um, but our response was the same, to turn to prayer and to God. And then that took us on a rough but beautiful journey. Wow. That still continues today in all its beauty. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. And so what happens after this news? Like we know you have children now. Yeah. But please, talk, elaborate. So, yeah, to fast forward, um, we've had 10 children, three who we lost in miscarriages and seven beautiful, everyone calls their kids beautiful, seven beautiful <laughs> children here with us. So four boys, three girls, aged from essentially three and a half to 18 and a half. Um my wife comes home one day after 
attending the weekly prayer group and she was all emotional. I'm like, okay, what's going on here? Um, she, s- she said, I just told the girls to pray for us. She put the intention out publicly for the first time. My wife's more of an introvert. I'm more the extrovert, but I didn't see it as a big deal. She said, are you, she asked me, are you okay with that? And I said, yeah, I'm, I'm cool. <laughs> but it was a big thing for her to step out and seek more prayers and help. And a lady from our parish had reached out after that because she heard of the prayer intention and said, um, he's since passed, Father Luke, that he has got the gift of praying over women, especially women who have fertility issues, and he prays, he's got the gift of tongues. I didn't know what any of this meant. And my wife said, I think I should go. Are you okay with that? I said, yeah, okay, if you're okay with it. I didn't go with her. She took a day off work and she went. She went to Hunter's Hill. She came back. And she said, he prayed over me and it was amazing. He was gibbering these words, had no idea what he was saying. He pointed out where my issues are. I'm like, wow, he didn't know I got pox. He gave me the phone number of Dr. Veronica O'Connell, Catholic doctor, go see her. Um, This was about, let's say, October. And he said, in February, you'll conceive. And she's like, okay. So she told me this. And she calls Dr. Veronica O'Connell. We start natural family planning, crash course, learning about our body, about the female body, how it works. And my firstborn son was born November 5, conceived in February. And I I was a type of person, not that I was anti-miracles, but, but his stories from the old ladies of miracles. And I'd, I'd just be like, yeah, whatever. Yeah. And here I am now sharing my miracle story Um I know it to be true. Um, and I understand when people may be skeptical as well. But that is what happened. Praise God. Absolutely. Praise yeah. God. That's incredible. Thanks be to God. So that's that's after this whole like how, how long from so you said two and a half around two and a half years is when um you've sort of gone, okay, God, like help us out a little bit. Yes. How long after that was this? Um, yeah, it was that six, like that two and a half to three years, he moved mountains, absolute mountains. So um, you, I, that was that six month period. Obviously, we have nine months of pregnancy. Um, but still, I, I had my vices, my addictions. And then the second born son comes along. And had I changed? Maybe. But not really. My wife's, I was now thankful. I've got kids, I've got boys. And if someone had asked me, <laughs> we laugh now, my goodness. Um, had everything sorted out. And I said, we'll have two kids. And my wife's like, we'll have three. This was before this, you know. Um, I thought you could map these things out, but obviously you can't. And when my second born son come along, my wife started to press the issue. And I was behaving the same. I was still playing soccer, still hanging out with the mates, with the boys, staying back, not only playing but organising, going back then you'd go to judiciary for other players, doing all, all this extracurricular. Mind you, absolutely nothing with the faith, zero. Still had my addictions that came out to the light in the marriage, which I didn't want to come out, but praise God it did. And then that's when the earthly purging started. So um, with two young boys, uh, my my world was turned absolutely upside down. So from the outside, everything looked good. um, But on the inside, it wasn't good. And that's where my wife started to write me letters. And that's when JP2 comes into play because... She got exposed to the writings of JP2, Theology of the Body. And she then, the best way she thought she could articulate and share this with me was by writing me letters. And she wrote me letters. And they killed my life. Absolutely killed my life. In a good way, obviously. But I was destroyed. And I was destroyed because I never in my life heard what love is first time in my life i heard that love is to all the good of the other is 
that love is a decision, love is a sacrifice. And I felt like I was betrayed by everyone and I got angry and I'd be like, why didn't the schools, why didn't, um, my, God, my parents didn't know, why didn't anyone tell me this? Why? And I couldn't, I literally couldn't sleep. I'd go to work, had to go to work and still function and pay the bills and put a brave face on out there. But I was trying to work this out because what it did for me was that I had to change the way I was going to live. I, I, the question was, how do I go on living tomorrow? Because the way I've been operating has been a lie. That's where I was at, crisis point. Can I ask, There, are, so at such a point of confrontation where you're like, everything I've known is basically like almost a lie sort of thing. Mm. There, there are two responses that I, at least that I can think of where you you either do something about it, which I assume we're going to get to. <laughs> and the other response is to just completely shut it out because to change what you've known for so long is just too much to bear. Mm. What made you choose to act on it to change logic absolute logic so um i'm a type of person that when i'm into sport when i was into soccer i am into soccer <laughs> right in there if i'm playing i'm playing if i'm coaching which i did i'm coaching tactically you know don't like to do things just half-baked so I quickly realized that pornography is eight times more addictive than heroin because of the chemical drops that go on and, and all that dopamine hits. So I got very logical. I remember reading this book by William Dre Struthers, um, Wired for Intimacy. And I read this book. It's all the brain studies. And I knew it to be true, straight up. And at that time, I was searching. People didn't know. I was going to Kurong Bookstore um, over in Ride, West Ride, um, and I was buying every, every anti-Catholic book you could because I wanted to see if our faith was the one true faith. And I was reading of ex-Catholic priests, priests, ex-Catholics who had converted to, uh, out, out of the church. And then I went to the Islamic bookstore, Bukhari, Who's Prophet Muhammad? Who is he? Um, so I was doing this whole mesh every which way you could because the internet had information, but not as much as it does today. It was a bit more bare. Listening, reading, all in. Um, also, there comes in Perusia, where he was at his original place, the CDs. So I was absorbing, taking it all in. The problem I had... But God knew what he was doing. I felt alone, physically alone, didn't have mateship. I didn't feel like I could tell a soul, couldn't tell my dad, couldn't tell any of my cousins, my mates. Um, but as Mother Teresa says, the longest journey in the world is from the head to the heart. And so here it just made logical sense. And I literally cut off those addictions overnight. I just said, that's it, stop. And by the grace of God, I did not fall once by the grace of God to this day on some of those heavy addictions. It's a miracle. It's another miracle. Obviously, someone's praying for me. Um, but yeah, logic. Logic would be my answer. I just want to give that some context. Yeah. Oh, that was awesome. Um, yeah. Then the purging came, my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> so when, you're, when your wife is writing you letters... Um, without going into the intimacy of what is contained in those letters, clearly the woman you love, the woman you've married, the woman who is the mother of your children is pouring out her heart and what her prayers are for you and what she wants of this marriage. You then start going on this journey of figuring things out. Um, does she start to see the change in you? Do others start to see the change in you? Are you receiving encouragement? Are you receiving resistance? 
what's happening while this is all while you're literally changing before people's eyes yeah so my wife was very loving and when i say loving she absolutely never gave up on me but she was tough she spoke the truth and that's why i i did often think give me a break like i'm i'm working on this i I can't fight on five fronts. I just can't. I can't remember where the kids' undies are. <laughs> Still can't. <laughs> we laugh about that. And um, so she was loving that she she was so persistent. She was my constant. Um, but I had no brotherhood. And, and, and this might give you a clue as to why I think God has led me to, to where I am because I was starting to pray, things are coming to light, and I thought I would have to leave Barella. So in Barella, we have a beautiful uh, Croatian community. There's a beautiful community, full stop, but a lot of mates, a lot of friends, and a culture of, of sport, of drinking, all of that. I didn't know how I could be a man of faith and still be their friends. I, I was like, the only way I can do this is to cut this. So I thought I would have to move. And that's what I wanted to do. Took it to prayer, not knowing how, but I did. But it was very clear that I was called to, you stay here. You need to stay here and fight. Um, only now, reflecting on the years before, I can see why I needed to be there or why he wanted me there. It was for my healing as well. You know, some people have thanked me, but I thank them because it's through others they gave me the opportunity to grow in virtue. You know, when, when people say you pray for, for I want to grow in patience and then two minutes later God gives you a situation to practice your patience, you're like, what? <laughs> yeah. I certainly had those situations to learn how to um, try to temper my drinking, social drinking, um, how late to stay out at night, all that type of thing. And God did wonders. Yeah. I I just stayed there. It was important that I was there. I'm glad. Jeez, I'm glad I did. And so your soccer mates and the social crowd, how are they reacting to all of this? Um, I think I kept it underground for a while and then and then it started seeping out. Um, and I didn't intend of it. For it to come out but it would just happen in in chats having a beer with a mate or some gathering or when i least expected it i'm like why did you say that but it's like the holy spirit gave me the words and so what unofficially happened was i was just talking to mates about this stuff and they're asking me questions and then they just start opening up and the way I explain it is men were getting on their knees, literally on their knees. Um, and the men's group started, started with beers. And um, a good mate of mine, um, we would catch up often. And he told me years later, he said, do you know how close Ivica I was to going away from you? Because you pushed the limit, the boundary so hard that my head was spinning. He had to change the way to, that he was going to operate. I never knew that at the time. And he came back and what's happened? He's gone out, shared with others. And then another man falls and another. And <laughs> I've literally seen men just fall like a domino set. And and this beautiful brotherhood organically just just grow just grow and that may not have happened should you had moved away absolutely yeah. absolutely and and god kept blessing us mm. um, with the gift of children at times when we thought we weren't ready or that we could financially whatever it was but um he knows best i just want to commend you for saying when we asked you about family life for saying that you have 10 children. You counted your miscarriages. It's an extremely difficult thing 
and I know many families out there that struggle with this, but it's a very pro-life message mm. uh, because whether the baby was six hours old or six months or near full term, mm. it's a human life. And so even in the loss of um, children through miscarriage, you name them, you, are, you acknowledge them. Mm. Um, and I think we as a culture need to get better at doing that to acknowledge that that precious gift of human life in the womb. Um, and so I just wanted to highlight that because usually the response will be, oh, I've got seven kids. Mm. We only count the ones that are here on earth. Whereas that's a powerful thing. And I know that's difficult for for men, but especially women who have been through, you know, the trauma of a miscarriage, they're not easy to go through. Mm. Um, and we get into this whole, uh, I suppose, cycle of when someone finds out they're pregnant, don't say anything for the first three months um, because the chances of miscarriage are, are high at that point. Um, and look, I understand that if they don't want to share it with the world completely. But the reality is the first three months you have – a human being in your body. It's okay. real. It's it's a stage of life. So it's a human life. Um, so I just wanted to commend you on that and just highlight that a little bit because that is something that a lot of people struggle with. Amen. Yeah. I mean, the other thing I'd most probably share, um, Anthony, when you asked about what did I go to, I said logic. The other really important thing that's sustained us is Sunday. And Sunday Mass. So this whole thing of what were the anchor points? How could I start my healing? Not through any intellect or theological understanding. I knew Sunday Mass was important. And therein lies the decision of being dragged to Mass as opposed to now willingly saying, yes, rain, hail, or shine, that it wasn't reliant on my feelings because Love is not a feeling, it's a decision. You know, I like to share with the kids, I don't know that Jesus Christ felt like getting nailed here and there, but <laughs> but he gave everything. He didn't hold back. Um, so along with logic, Sunday Mass was the absolute anchor points that were non-negotiable. And that's what happened in our life. Um, and I guess... People saw that. So even, I say, the kids' birthdays, all these invites we got stopped. We got no invites around that time. It's like people knew. We didn't put a broadcast down. We had to make the hard decision a few times and we said, no, sorry, we can't make it. But I can certainly share now, in all the years of fatherhood, for a long time now, I, we don't get invites for, for example, kids' birthdays on Sunday mornings. Um, and there's also a story here about sport as well, which we can't talk about in Sunday sport. Um, but I remember my son, my eldest son, who was a a good local soccer player, played in the in the local comps. And then someone said, "Hey, maybe he should try out. It's called MPL or SAP or whatever the representative teams." And he said to me, "Okay, yeah, I wouldn't I wouldn't mind trying." And we went. And the coach came up to me after said, I think your son's good and, and would like to take him. And I said, okay, well, what's what's the commitment, you know? And part of it was a fair bit of Sunday games. And I remember talking to my son. And we're just talking about it. And back and forth. And I was trying to convince him of anything. I was just talking. What do you think? And he said to me, I don't think I should play. And I said, why? He said, because of Sunday it will break up our family. We'll have to split up to go to Mass. That were his words to me. Wow. And I went, okay, and we got home, and it just organically happened, and the response was no. And I share that decision. That decision for my family, as simple as it sounds, was a huge, another huge anchor point. With everything else that had happened, all of it could have been undone by this simple decision. So I understand when dads, you know, they love their son or daughter 
and they may be good at what they do, the temptation to do this. But if you don't involve God, how do you know what God's saying? If you just take God away and you look at the, the physical, logistical aspect only, well, then you're only getting half an answer. Um, so I think that's really important to share here because we love sport. We do. <laughs> What's remarkable about that is that that was your son's decision to make. Yeah. Um, and look at the effect it had on the family. Like if your family can stay together through a decision like that and not compromise, then you're all in on Sundays, all in. Yep. Um, it's quite remarkable. I haven't heard that before. Because if most people were giving their children the option, um, and it, I think it speaks to the relationship you have with your son and the way that he's been brought up to be a God-fearing man, a man who understands what's most important, um, then that would have just been, yeah, I want to be the next soccer superstar. And that's a really unique story and a beautiful one. Yeah, so I, some other dads ask me often about Sunday sport or, or activities or how's it go with getting the kids to mass. I, I'm open to talk about it, but I struggle now to speak about it from the viewpoint of up until today, we haven't in my family had a situation where my parents have, my parents, my children have fought us to go to Sunday mass. If anything, they lead the way. They get ready. It's just known um, so I'll share that because it's a, it's a common question and I struggle to speak to it because it's not something now that I have lived um, up until now. I don't know what the future holds, but the kids are all in. Can I just add to this? This is remarkable. So I experience it sometimes also with my brother and my sister-in-law and their marriage and their family. It's just something that you guys did as parents. You've taken your children to church and it became something that is the non-negotiable throughout the week. So if you're a child growing up, that's what you're doing. That becomes part of the routine and you don't have to necessarily understand everything. Mm. We've spoken about that on the show before. You don't have to understand everything, but you know that Sunday is a special day because we're getting up and going to mass in the morning, which we don't do throughout the week. We might not do throughout the week. So Sunday is a unique day for that. And that then just becomes what we expect to do each and every week, which is why I tell young parents, young families all the time, go to Mass. Go to Mass. If you don't go to Mass, then your children won't get into that routine. They won't get into that habit. And then Mass becomes what they experience when they go to school. Mm. And we all know that sometimes that, that can be abused a little bit because Masses don't happen the way Masses should um, unless, of course, you've got a priest that says, no, this is the way the school mass is going to be. And they don't then fall off when they get to the age where statistically they do fall off because they start to understand. So whilst your children haven't resisted, you and your wife certainly got them there to the point where it's like, this is what we do on Sundays. It's such an important and powerful witness to the way a family goes in the faith and you're very intentional about your Sunday and the way you live it. And then when it came to the decision for your son to say, well, it could be a potential soccer career, but this will be the sacrifice, he chose otherwise. It's very powerful. That's yeah, and, and, and I, um, I've been very humbled <laughs> and challenged by my children and this is one example when people go, how are you challenged in that? Well, you were challenged like to, to be a better man. Like what, what would have I done? What have I done? All those reflective questions. Um, but yeah, Sunday, Sunday and the attack on leisure, we have to work so hard on know, to know how to make Sunday be set apart from every day of the week. And I think that's the attack on their family today. I think a lot of the decisions actually flow out from that, what you do on your Sunday. How does this Sunday look? Do you just binge on a whole bunch of stuff? Or is there intentionality with 
with giving time to worship and togetherness. Um, yeah, I, I love it. When I just reflect on it, I'm like, wow, thank you, God. I, I, I didn't believe that he could bless us abundantly when I was going through that earthly purging. I just thought, when is this end? When is this going to end? Um, but I see the light. Yeah. It'll end when you give yourself to me completely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That happens. That's yeah. beautiful. I just want to um, I want to ask you about so just while you were talking about um, making or uh, considering God I guess and then and and making him the center of your decisions um, and you also said earlier that uh, the priest who prayed over your wife so father Luke was it mm -hmm. father Luke recommended you to a Catholic doctor mm -hmm. so last week, we had Robert Haddad on the show who said um, his experiences through anxiety and depression were best addressed by a Catholic psychologist. Mm -hmm. So why is it so important that when we do need that sort of help, you know, a psychologist, a doctor, whatever it is, um, why do you think that, that it's so important that it be a Catholic one? Yeah, so when it, when it gets old, it speaks specifically to fertility, but I think it's it's more than that. Yeah. But this example, I'll give you this example encounter I had with a person, Adrian. Pray for Adrian. Love him. Um, Adrian first told me he's an atheist, then he's an agnostic, that he hates the Pope. But he did my air conditioning. That was my interaction with Adrian. And I'm still in semi-regular touch with adrian and so a few years ago he he did one job for me and then my air conditioning at my house went and he did my place and everyone had left now and my wife said oh we're, we're gonna go to like her parents house we'll see you soon two three four hours later my wife's texting me where are you five hours later i'm still not there i got held up with adrian at my house me and him alone at that time, I had six children, and he looked at the photo and said, bro, you got six kids, I can't even have one. Like, what's going on? Me and my girlfriend have been trying for ages. And we just started to talk. And before that, we are talking about faith. But we just, he had this openness. Um, and so we spoke and we spoke and we spoke. And then in the end, he said, could I come over with my girlfriend and could she speak to you guys and to your wife and I was telling him about the charting and I was so excited of you have these days and that days and when you ovulate and when you can conceive and when you can't um it's more effective than any other type of contraception and he's like man and so he did he came over um with his girlfriend and me and Adrian we split up as the men talking and she was talking to um, my wife and my wife later shared with me, as soon as he walked away, she said to my wife, I believe in God. I believe in God. He's just, he's just, you know, struggling. But what it did, it just paved the way for a conversation. I said to Adrian in the end, I said, look, you're going to have to get over the word Catholic if you want help in fertility. And he came back to me and he understood why, because there's no money in true fertility care because to learn your body takes time to read a woman's cycle can be done i know that a hundred percent i've seen it i see it it's real i've seen it in action and the more women that knew how to read their bodies and meant to have a, a basic understanding the better it would be for humanity um, absolutely the less drugs we would consume trying to regulate, irregulate. Well, you don't even know what your body's doing. So what are you trying to regulate? So he came back to me and he said, the $10,000 tubal we did on my girlfriend, I now know was a waste of money. I have been duped. And I know everything you've shared and everything I read now to be true. And now I know why it's only the Catholic Church that is invested in fertility. Where... Who's at the front and center? The person. This is coming from a person who told me he was atheist, 
an agnostic and pray for him and his conversion. Um, he hasn't come in fullness with the faith, but he's open. And through fertility, it was just logic. Makes perfect sense. So I don't know if that answers your question, but I wanted to give a real life example um, of this rather than some hypothetical. Yeah, no, that's that's awesome. Because I, I was I was talking with uh, with my girlfriend Sarah. Um, we were talking about the whole Catholic psychologist thing, and um, and th- that's a perfect practical example because we were sort of discussing it and we were saying, okay. Um, what is it that makes them different from everyone else? It's not just the fact that the fact that they're, you know, a baptized Catholic. It's that the help, exactly what you said, the person is the center of what they're, uh, of what they're trying to, to do or who they're trying to help. And in order to understand the person more fully, you'd need to know or to understand that this is a person created and loved by God and their deepest sense of identity, like we've said plenty of times on the show, is that they're a son or daughter of God. And so to help the person in a more full way, they'd need to have that understanding of the full person. I don't know if I'm really... No, this is perfect because this is a thing. Spiritual and physical... So in a medical sense, I've posed this question when being confronted with this. Doctor, what are you afraid of investigating the person more so medically? We've got to be open to what we're going to find, not close mind and say, this is what it is. So what you're saying is, is spot on. And we sometimes, even as, as Catholics, as as in our case, men trying to live out the faith, it's very easy to separate the body and soul. Mm -hmm. And we shouldn't be doing that. Even when it comes to medicine, we take the approach in medicine like we do in the spiritual life where everything's uncovered. So when it gets to fertility, you need to uncover this. Be open. Um, And I... Of often for many years, I asked the question, why? Why are so many doctors fearful of finding out what the female body is doing? Why? Wow, this is, we're missing the mark, totally missing the mark. Mm-hmm. And it's, it, it really, it doesn't anger me. Once upon a time, it, it so saddens me. Like a carpenter just doing half a job. It just there's no there's no logic to it at all, and it breaks the heart. Mm. What you think about it? If it's uh, the doctor that sat across the table from you and your wife and said you're never going to have children, they're just reading symptoms and signs and every. How many years would that doctor have been in medical school and studied and done all that type of thing? They're drawing on a knowledge of what they've learned, and so by all accounts. You guys are the no hopers. Sorry, you'll never have kids again, or you'll never be able to have children. Look at you now. So they they got it wrong, and we're not dumping on the medical science in all. any way. Not at all. But it is important to know, and Anthony, going to your question too, that the Catholic psychologist or the Catholic fertility expert, they put the Catholic framework, and they open up. Yes. The um, they broaden the horizon, the wholeness of the person, where it's not just everything about a human being is contained in this book. So to be a good doctor, you read this book, you'll be a good doctor. But we know that that's not the way it happens because everything in this book is the discovery of man. It's the medical sciences, the psychological sciences, all this type of thing. Some of these sciences, in for example, Dr. Robert Haddad's instance, some of these sciences are just theories in psychology you look at people like sigmund freud and that a lot of that stuff is being debunked as we go through time and so we see the wholeness the fullness of the human person so from a doctor that went sorry you'll never have kids so well look at us now we were able to have children and we didn't have to do it through the aid of any kind of science 
we just took the time and opened up our hearts to allow God's will to work through and, and to learn about ourselves. Just to add to this example, so a good number of men over the years that have spoken to me that we're in that the couple they've they've got they're dealing with fertility issues, it's also a burden on the man. And usually they won't tell their wife. That's very common. And I guess man to man they they open up a little bit. But what I discovered was to my shock, I shared what the doctors said to me. And I would say to the the fellow man I was talking to, this is what they said to you about your sperm count, this, that. They said, how'd you know? It's the same script. And I've, I've tested this with so many different men, even with my brother Adrian. Men looked at me and go, how did you know? I said, because that's the script they use. They'll tell you it's this, your sperm's that, that, that. Yeah. You're like, oh, wow. So something... Something's missing. Yes. Something's going on. Indeed. Mm -hmm. Indeed. But it's a good question. It's a, and it's a huge discussion. It's a yeah. massive discussion. It's a yeah. Massive discussion. Um, so thanks be to God. What a journey that you've been on. Mm -hmm. um, and the courage it took for you to just keep your family where you are, to grow up in the area that you did, and not to flee from what you thought was going to be the cause of you growing in your faith yeah. or, or the, the hindrance from you growing in your faith. And then over beers, men start opening up. You start talking to people. More and more men are like, I need an outlet. Why is it that men feel more comfortable just speaking with other men? Why aren't men confiding in their partners their wives why is it what is it about men coming together and just having a chat now this is getting into yeah <laughs> i'll say that and and i've heard it said in many different ways and funny ways i think you know look at women and their plumbing they are so much more complicated than we are and hormonally we're hormonal being beings and that's a beautiful thing our hormones are always talking to each other you watch a movie for those who game um ride a bike whatever you do there's there's oxytocin releases dopamine things are going on and pheromones and from the females and that's why us men find certain females more attractive it's nature at work it, it it's a beautiful thing um men don't want to crush their women they want, don't want to burden their women. We, we naturally, instinctively are the leader in the home, regardless of, um, of what society is saying and, and pop culture and the movies have portrayed dads to be and not to be, is we are naturally the leader in the home. And I think it's as simple as for that reason um, we have this, and I'm generalising here, we have this natural fear of not wanting to think that our spouse or girlfriend, whatever the case may be, that we're sort of failing that. We're not living up to that. And if I share with her, with you, my my failings as my wife, as my girlfriend, I'm just going to crush you. There's something inside that tells you that. And I'll say in my experience, a lot of times that is true. It's this whole thing of sharpening um, as Proverbs Iron you know, sharpens iron. Absolutely. Nothing else can sharpen iron. Now, I'll, I'll deep dive a little bit deeper because the catechism talks about faith and reason. And I'll paraphrase here. It talks about the man who makes emotional-led decisions that basically chaos ensues. Um, love my father. Love him dearly. And he's still with us. Thanks be to God. A lot of his decisions that he's made in his life are emotional-led. And I know he knows that, but he struggles with that. When you make emotional-led decisions, you're doing that because you aren't sharpened. And then the question herein lies, if men are called to make these decisions, which they always don't feel like, because I've said things to my children, let me tell you, which I just have not wanted to have the conversation but you have to man up and do it. You have to. Because if you don't, 
the floodgates will open. But you can only do that in a state of sharpening. And I use the football analogy, sporting analogy. If you're not sharpened, if you're not on the training field, well then how can you go out on game day and, and play well? And you can't expect to not train and be sharpened in training and then do your training in the game. No, no, in the game, it's execution time. Just like when your 15-year-old son confronts you about something, it's not a time to train. You have needed to be training where? By going to Sunday Mass. Every Sunday Mass, rain, hail or shine. That's the sharpening effect. So now, again, the question we're herein lies, where do I get sharpened? How do I get sharpened by other men? It's not a question of maybe I'll get sharpened or if I decide to do it. No, no, it has to be where and when and intentional because if you don't do it, you won't be sharpened and there'll be decisions made that are more emotional led, which leads to chaos. Absolutely. We could we could draw this on on a on a whiteboard. You could see the correlation. Um so why do men want to speak to men? Because naturally that's where they get sharpened. But where we get sharpened, what can happen? The opposite as well. So you can have a group of mates who can totally blunt you or sharpen you or do nothing. And they're, they're the, again, manning up, asking those serious questions. Where am I spending my time? A lot of guys get fearful. I'm like, okay, because they're talking to me. What are you doing? You're playing golf. I'm not bagging your golf, but if you're going to man up, man up. Is the golf sharpening you or not? If it is, thumbs up. You don't have to tell me. Have it out with God. What else are you doing? What's your weekly diary looking like? Do you need to go to the gym? Maybe you do. But ask the questions. Involve God. Because when I ask that question of other men, they think I'm attacking their golf or gym or sport. No, I'm not. I'm challenging you to question it with God. Because you only have 24 hours a day, as I do. And for eight of them, we're meant to sleep. And like you don't have much time. So I'll give this example, and I've shared this lately. There's a beautiful man who I love dearly, Marinko. Marinko's older than me, an ex-heroin addict. The man that I most feared in my younger days. Walk into Brella Station, Marinko's a meter 98. He was a petty thief, got involved with other criminals, prostitutes, and heroin addicts. He was clinically dead. To fast forward, became a, a heavy, heavy heroin addict. We used to call him a junkie. And when I'd walk through the tunnel in Barala, and I had no escape, and he was there, he's got big hands, big man. I was scared of him. That same man now is the man who sharpens me. Thanks be to God, he was in hospital dying. They put a... um. They couldn't find any veins. Everything was collapsed. It went from here. They ended up putting the drip, you know, they put the feet directly in on his heart. And when he was clinically dead, he had a supernatural experience. And when he woke up, which was a miracle in of itself, they're going to give him methadone so the body doesn't go into shock. He said, no, no more methadone. And the nurse was celebrating because she most probably hasn't seen someone do that. And he had huge withdrawal symptoms. But from that day, all his addictions, all his addictions have gone away. And he's a man now that lives down on the south coast and he shares his story and he's come to Christ and he comes up to the men's rosary crusade and this is how he sharpens me after we pray. He comes up to me usually, shakes my hand, Ivica, and I just be with him for 30 seconds. He doesn't have to say anything. I just have to be in his presence. And then he walks off. And that was my sharpening. The greatest blessing, um, the irony, yeah, the man who, who scared me most is now the man that does the opposite. And these men exist, but when our eyes are blinded by golf, sport, addictions, you don't see this because you're making emotional-led decisions. So we've got to get those, the wind wipers on just to, to open up our vision a bit and we get sharpened. This is sharpening. Me sitting with you, being here, this is an act of sharpening.
And then when this happens in a marriage, this whole thing which is controversial in the secular world of women, wives submit to your husbands, the wives have happily submit. Why? Because the man is leading the mission. Leading the mission and she will gladly submit. That I have lived, I have seen the transformation and I am, thanks be to God, not by my own power, am living that and I'm seeing that in play. So that's maybe the depth of yeah. what we're talking about there. It is and there's been such a need for that in the day and age we live in um, that it's been identified and, and almost um, there's been a need to almost formalise this in into a ministry. And so what started off as just having a few beers together, you've identified the need for it to be formalised into a ministry to help other people all around Sydney and around the world. We're seeing an uprising. Um, how do you... Do you go to the Archdiocese of Sydney and say, look, there's a real gap here, we need this? Did they identify it? Are they looking for a guy exactly in your mould that's had these experiences? Like, how does this all come about? Yeah, so I never worked for the church. I started giving my time to my parish, started doing sacramental prep, um, running men's groups, all organically. And I remember my wife a few times saying, be great if you could get paid for this. You know, we're trying to balance out the time. I, I need to be present, um, but we're seeing the fruits of the labor. These men who were on their knees were sharpening me. It was all happening. And in early 2020, this is the short story. I was praying to St. Joseph for two years because three different priests said to me, pray to St. Joseph. And my question to the priest was, I feel like I'm called to do something more for the church, more intentionally. But I don't know how it's meant to look. I said, pray to St. Joseph. So this is before the year of St. Joseph. And I prayed to St. Joseph and I one day go to work in late January 2020. I've been at Coates High for 20 years. And that afternoon, and I didn't know I was going to do this, I resigned from my job. Not a soul knew, not my wife. And at that time, I'm the the sole bread income earner. Um, my wife was pregnant with number seven. Only us two knew. It was early days and I resigned from my job. And I, the weight of the shoulders was off, off me totally. And I then told them what I wanted to do and live for Jesus. Um, I rang my wife and I said, I've resigned. She didn't know. Her response was, thank God about time. It was in her prayers as well. Wow. <laughs> um, so my wife shares this story. I'm, it's out there. It's not a secret. And then, as as we know, two or three months later, COVID hit, which no one knew was coming, and we went into lockdown, and my family had the greatest year of our life, of sabbatical, the greatest year of our life. And I don't mean to be that trivial because I know the lockdowns were a hard time for many. It was the greatest blessing in our life, 2020, 2021. And somebody contacts me to say, hey, there's a job in the Life, Marriage, Family Office, Men's Ministry, I think you'd be perfect. And I print off the job description, I give it to my wife, and I go take this to prayer. She comes back and she said, look, you, you have to apply. And I applied on the death and... I honestly say this humbly, not with any talking up. I was surprised to to get offered the position. Um, I shared my heart in that interview um, as much as I could. Um, it was like no other interview. didn't feel like a business interview at all. I just poured out my heart and they offered me the position. And um, that was January 27. I started in 2022 and... Away we went, and what a ride it's been the last two and a half plus years. So I want to get into the guts of this ministry, but before we do, because it may have sounded a little odd to people, when you say that that year of COVID was a blessing on your family, what does that year look like? Um, we read the scriptures every day. We did online mass every day. 
and now I'm smiling because you guys will see it here on the table. This is my son. We had to listen to two masses a day. My younger son at the time said mass to us every single day <laughs> at home. <laughs> Family walks, awesome. Lectio Divina. I was reading encyclicals, I had time to read. I painted the house. We were just this family. Not once did my children complain, um, hearing from other parents. We just, it was grace-filled. It was, uh, peaceful would be the word. And we, we grew as a family in faith. We were able to absorb the scripture, walk to our local church, go for walks through the streets. We didn't have to rush to go anywhere. It was am amazing. So that's what it was for us. And, and just to be real about it too, you know, you're doing this with seven children, okay? So it's not a walk in the park. It's not as though... You lived on your own and you were just happy to be, um, you know, on your own for a year in a lockdown because people can have that response, that that guttural response is, well, you didn't struggle the way I struggled. You still mm -hmm. had to put food on the table for your family. Yep. So there was a lot of struggle in that grace-filled period too. Yes, yeah. yeah. Um, lack of unemployment, um, total unknown on so many fronts. But this totally outweighed. I, I almost can't put words to it. I look back and I almost go, was that even real? We as a family, my boys play the piano accordion, the piano, my daughter plays the violin. We would be at a, as a family in my back pergola singing. We would sing often. Um, and I remember we've got a, a Croatian Catholic community group chat in Barala. And we'll take in requests. <laughs> and we would film ourselves <laughs> singing the song, sharing it on the group chat, you know, with 50, 60 other families. And I just can't tell you how the blessings, the, the interactions I had with people on the street at that time, I never would have had. And they wouldn't have had, and I'm the better and my family better for it. I built a little, I'm going to say shrine in front of the house, bordering with my neighbor, old pallets, built a cross on top, put sacramentals in there, holy water, depending what time it was, when it was Divine Mercy, Divine Mercy cards, Holy Rosary cards, broadcasted it out to our community on the group chat. People were coming past, the word spread, and they were taking holy water. And a neighbor across the road from me comes over and she said, Ivica, you are not to take that down. I said, why? She said, there's, a, there's an Asian man that walks past every morning. He's not Christian. He stops, he takes his hat off, and he prays in front of here. Had Muslims asking me about things. My garage was open. People, I was having conversations about the faith in my front yard because of what we left there. Rosary was hanging on top. Image of Our Lady, and this is still there. I've since sold this house, and Chris who's bought the house said, I'm not getting rid of this. Um, I, it, just amazing. Uh, there, there's... I can't put words to this. It was it's, wild. It almost is a a revisiting of the way life used to be when <laughs> and and you saw that people that had the presence of mind to realize that life was never that complicated got through covid a lot easier than people that just have no idea. You know. So it's it's an interesting thing. It and is. Thank you for sharing that with us. I thought it was just important to highlight that even in the midst of apparent suffering and things not going the way we expect them to go, your family flourished. They, they flourished because God's at the center. And so, no, thank you. Thank you for that. Yeah, and it's so awesome to see the joy with which you <laughs> you speak about that time. Like it's so it's it's so clear on your face, like the the joy that you experienced in that year and um uh it's like it's it's i mean to echo what father ben was saying it, it wasn't like you just ignored all the struggles and and things that were going on and the concerns and the worries but it was that the the good just outweighed the bad absolutely you know? and it sometimes it can sound so disappointingly simple 
um, the solution to our, our issues and things. But but it, it's as simple as that. The good outweighed the bad. And like I, I just thought the joy that is on your face <laughs> when <laughs> you, talk you talk about, about that it. is awesome. It's such a... Um, uh, I don't know. It, 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 it's contagious. It makes me want to experience the same thing. So it's awesome. Um, but if we can get into the meat of, <laughs> like Father Ben said, into the meat of your ministry, mm -hmm. um, I, I for one am completely new to this. Like I, I don't know what what it is that you do exactly. Like on a day to day basis, what. What does it look like for you? What what exactly is the ministry that you're... All right, so... And to add to that, when you do get the job, do they give you a clean slate or do yeah. you have to conform to what they expect you to do? So I think mm. that ties in with that. Yeah, okay. So um, I start. It sits, for a brief explanation, it sits in the Sydney Centre of Evangelization. Within that, there's a life marriage family office and that's where the men's ministry um, is still currently sitting, which makes sense because it's part of the family. Um, now, what I got was the name of two men and their phone numbers and a brief outline of what's happening, the Camino of St. Joseph and some men's breakfasts. So the names that I received are these two men and two numbers. I already had met these men. My predecessors did a fantastic job in getting this started. And then it was difficult because of the lockdown situation. I come in, the world opens up, get the name and number of these two men, and I basically get out there and find out what's going on. Because I, I, in my simple mind, I, I was expecting a spreadsheet, you know, of all these leaders and who, you know, look, I always use the analogy of youth ministry. It's much more well advanced. And you could say, oh, yeah. Look at all these parishes. They have youth ministry. They meet once a fortnight, once a month. They're the leaders. And away you go. So the men's space was was bare in that way. And I just started talking. And it was February and it was due, the Camino was due to happen, the overnight walking pilgrimage for men in late April. And I was like, okay, you organize it. Cool. Got no idea where I'm going to start. So what do I do? I start talking to the men that I know, and that's how I met yourself, because someone said, do you know Deacon Ben? I said, no, I don't. And eventually, you know, caught up with yourself. I just kept catching up with as many good men and priests, and they just kept giving leads. And I started building this database and where they were linked to which men's groups. And to my amazement, there was much more out there than I had ever even imagined or anyone I think imagined. It was now that we just had this compiled um, on some sort of list. And the reason why we started the Camino of St. Joseph uh, at St. Jerome's Punch Bowl in 2022 is because three different people asked me, do you know Father Joseph Gideon? Once, a second time, a third time. I went the third time, okay, I need to go meet Father Joseph Gideon. <laughs> And I went there and he was, he still does, the men's ministry does. And I thought, okay, God, this is where we're called to start um, the Camino of St. Joseph this year. So that's, that's where everything, and at the same time, I'll just share that prior to my employment, we started praying on the first Saturday of the month, the men's rosary crusade. Um, and that was in December of 2021. And there was about 30, 35 men and then this just continued on the first Saturday of each month. And in, remember, in February 2023, we most probably had about 60 men. And then the following month, it went to 120. And ever since then, I think there's never been under 100 men. We just kept praying. And I, in some way, I think that's fueled, that's been the engine to so much that's happened. In torrential rain, might I add, sometimes. Mm, absolutely, yeah. That that's a went powerful. Viral. That video went viral, didn't it? <laughs> it did, yeah. And the Lord the Lord blesses that. So that's and, – and the first Camino of St. Joseph, the year prior to me, had about 40, 45 men. So year two had 150 men gathered. So it was this natural build men were searching. And I was doing research, and what I found I'll, – I'll call it the post-COVID era – Men were, I look at what was Googled, men asking, you know, 
What's the meaning of life? What is love? Who is God? I'm hearing stories of guys who had three excavators. They've sold two and now they have one. They said, life's simpler. I, I don't need to push myself as much. I just want to make enough money you know, for the family and, and to be able to have that little bit extra. I don't need too much more. So all this is coming out. I read the Walk and Talk project, the Man's Walk and Talk project in Penrith gets 10,000 members. And all it was was men gathering at a park, put your phones away, they go for a walk and they talk. And I'm like, something's going on here. And so this men's rosary crusade's growing, more men are coming, talking, the Camino takes off. And and all I can just say is there's an explosion. There's an ex- absolute explosion of men not always physically getting on their knees. And it just grew and grew and grew. And Our Lady, St. Joseph, has been leading the way. You know, last year's Camino had 450 men, pilgrimage overnight, most probably 600 men at the Mass, opening Mass, and then this year, 750. And we had the first Be Not Afraid men's conference last year. Just so many good... And I've been contacted by the leader, a men's leader from Argentina, Fabian, who I'm in touch with, Owen Gallagher from Ireland, the men in Poland, um, priests are contacting me from Philippines, men from all over the country. We had a young man, Joseph, come to the Be Not Afraid men's conference last year, flew in for the day, went home, starts the men's rosary crusade, give me the script. Just there's so many of these little stories. uh, They're just endless. I'm absolutely humbled and it hasn't stopped as recently as today and yesterday messages, which I still need to get back to. Um, Linking up with a man by the phone on Perth who's going to do a men's walking pilgrimage. The guys in Brisbane going, we need to do this. We had a group of men from Melbourne come this year and last year. How do you do it? What do we? What can we do? Give us the tips. That, that's what I'm getting. I didn't want to go through the episode. I didn't want to use this word in the episode, but I'm going to. Is there anything toxic about these groups <laughs> that are being formed? <laughs> No, it's it's there's such such beauty. This I think the spirit of fear that might have been around has dissipated because these men absolute love and I mean ordered love. God first, others second. And and that's all I have seen. And men from all walks of life. I'll call it out because people are a bit oh, you know. I've had Chinese men come up to me going, I want to be a Catholic knight. I want to be a Catholic knight, but I can't do it in my community. Um, Not to go through every ethnic group, but you name it. That's why I want to call it out. Whether it's the Philos, whether it's the Anglo-Aussies. The comment I had over this weekend was, and I'll share this, God bless him, Callum. I can say his name. I was with him this weekend at the men's retreat for Men Alive. Amazing. Um, He said he came down to the Be Not Afraid men's conference from Newcastle and he was just so taken aback by the diversity of men, and I mean the true diversity of men, and that we were all brothers in Christ. No one cared. Who you? We've We've all got a story where we've come from. That's beautiful. But no one cared in the end all brothers in Christ. And that's what's happening when these men are now gathering, is there's this true brotherhood and fraternity that what's our anchor point? Nothing wrong with the Bulldogs at all. And that brings people together. But in this point, yes. it's Christ. Amen. 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 And then all this other stuff comes out. Some guys, they like fishing. They go, why don't we go to fishing? I like the footy. Maybe we'll catch up for a feed and go to the footy. It's like secondary. It's more ordered. Yes. Yeah. God is first. So I'm just seeing brotherhood spring up everywhere, everywhere. See, I, oh, sorry. I was just going to say, see, as you're talking, it's like this is this is just going on in my head right now. So I hope it comes out the way it's going on in my in my mind. Um, as you're talking, I'm thinking, what is it that's 
drawing these men to the to this ministry and like i've thought about it a lot before and um and i'm thinking you know it could be it could be the idea that uh, it could just be the the sort of masculine thing where if something's attacking us you know we want to fight back or <laughs> um or i don't know all these other things but now i'm thinking to use the analogy and the wording of of marriage as we do um uh, a lot of the time when we talk about our relationship with god uh so bridegroom bridegroom and bride right so in our homes uh for a, for a married man or for or for any fathers um or husbands they're the bridegroom in their house um or their parish and as the bridegroom they're the chief servant they they um you know they work to to serve their wife and their kids um as the head of their house and you know all the all the analogies that we use um but we're still human beings we're still finite well we have infinite souls but we <laughs> we we don't have we're not all knowing we're not all powerful we're not so when we look to our relationship with with god we're no longer the bridegroom we're part of the bride and so we need that source from uh sorry we need that uh we need i guess to to receive the gifts from our bridegroom in order to be the bridegroom in our home i don't know if this is sort of coming out well and as you're talking this is going on in my mind and i'm thinking okay this is this is where i'm at now i if i don't know if this is completely right or not (laughs) but that's where the root is it's not that we just want to fight back when something's attacking us though that is part of it um it's that in order to be the bridegroom that we know we need to be we need to receive it from the ultimate infinite bridegroom i hear you does that absolutely i don't know if i articulated that well yeah you have because i think that's the order that avitza is talking about. yeah that's right it's it's the god first mentality yes everything is properly ordered all about order yeah and in addition to that my question was going to be this is doing amazing thing for men who are having a reawakening in their faith lives but surely this has to be filtering through into their home life have you had any feedback from women from wives from mothers Mm. that have had men part of this journey over the last however many years it's been as to how it's changed their husbands absolutely yes can you can you speak to that a little bit yeah um it's pretty simple when when women share with me it's just you know that expression of joy you know when a face just lights up um i've had some ladies come to me and say can i give you a hug I'm like okay sure <laughs> um very very humbling for me so with my limited eyes god has allowed me to hear and see the spoken words and the physical response and reaction absolutely so um i don't know how else i don't think i could do give it justice with more words apart from that word of thanks yes there's stories um absolutely there's stories there's a lot of stories but it's just this is amazing please keep going whatever's happening just don't stop really that's another one thank you don't stop um and this like this look of anguish to hope and it's for brothers parish secretaries i call up parish secretaries to make a meeting and they just end up sharing their story about their husband or their their brother-in-law that came on the camino or this happened it just uh, it wow wow i don't know if that answers your question i just full on i mean the other thing i would share what we're talking about is the 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 ordering of love eros agape you know filial storge that the the types of love what male fraternity allows when you have healthy male fraternity is to order that love because men good men naturally order each other Mm. when it's bad brotherhood 
look at that chick. When it's healthy brotherhood, it's totally different. Mm. And so then what you're having, and, and you know this, we have in today's society where people are getting Eros mixed up in the wrong crowd on a Saturday night, filial loves over here, and they, they're attaching it in the wrong, oh yeah, agape, I'll, I'll, I'll put over when I'm out on Friday night. No. Healthy male brotherhood naturally gets you in order. Yes. Let me tell you. And usually it's that fraternal correction is just a look. Well, it's how are you, brother? Yeah. And that's enough. That's like, okay. And it's not stoic. It's, it's, you were talking about it before. It comes out of love. Totally out of love. I've had the experience of dealing with the Sydney City Police Command last year and this year Liverpool. And last year, as you guys know, there was some incident, like the, the incidences around Newtown and, and there was some fear from the police and Bishop Murray Murray. Um, and these all happened last year and then this year. But the police very evidently saw that we, we come in love. There's a bit of tradition to the Feast of St. Joseph the Worker. Um, and I can see their intrigue. We, we had two sergeants allocated to us this year. Had a great chat. They were on the two-way radios with us all night. Um, the St. John Ambulance guys were curious about this Benedict medal, which every participant got this year. So I went and got, and I gave it to them. And, and one of the paramedics just kissed and said, thank you. Not Christian. Said, thank you so much. I said, we will pray for you and um, please look after this. Gave him a prayer card. This is what it is. So these interactions are not just what you see. It's it's like with the contractors. It's with the stakeholders. It is anointed. It is blessed. God wants this. And amen. I mean, how, how good is this? Yeah. <laughs> As you're talking about this ordering of love and the, um, uh, the fraternal corrections, I'm thinking about a great man that we had on the show a number of shows ago now, I can't remember, Stephen Lawrence. Mm. And he shared the story about um, when he was on the team bus. He's an AFL player, now retired. He was on the team bus and uh, there was a pornographic film on the bus and he stood up and he actually walked down the bus, put a stop to it, and no one said anything to him. But all these years later, people say that that was one of the most impressive acts of leadership and courage they've ever seen. Because he rose above the boyish camaraderie and the real immaturity of what grown men can enter into sometimes, and he stood, took a stance against it. As you're telling that story, I'm like, that's all it took. That's it. And guys never spoke about it, but years later they pat him on the back and say, "I tell that story all the time." Yeah, that's what men need to do. And that's that sharpening. That's why we need to be sharpened. So when the instances arise, we're ready. We've been on the training field. Mm. Um, I'm blessed. We're blessed. Amen. It's good news. So I want to ask along the lines of what Father Ben asked a couple of minutes ago about, um, you know, wives and mothers and things uh, coming up to you. If, if your wife was sitting here now and your children and we asked them, how has the men's ministry helped Vitsa become a better husband and a better father, how would they answer that? In the home, that is. <laughs> yeah, I, I think it's, I, I can't obviously speak for them, but um, I think it's all, it's all, again, comes down to love. It's empowered me, it's given me the tools to be able to talk to my, you ask my um, six-year-old son, his love of feeling. And he'll tell you. He'll, he'll talk to you about love. And that gives me not that it's some knowledge. It, it gives me great joy and hope. Um, so it's empowered me to have the conversations that I need to have. And not just conversations because it's not a conversation. It's more a way of life. Um, and I would put it down just as simple as that. It's the sharpening I received. This whole thing of men's ministry is not about getting men away from their families, girlfriends, wives. It's actually to give more of their man to them. It's, it's the reordering. Mm -hmm. When I share this with men's ministry leaders, that 
we want to help each other, equip each other to not spend more time in this space, to actually spend less time that it's more efficacious. And when you share that, that you, they come here, they get fed, renewed, brotherhood, they go home, they're better men in the workplace, better men at home, on the sporting field, wherever it is. And that's, that's this whole concept because you can't do this alone. And I just need to share statistics, share that. The number one killer of men in this country, age 15 or 44, as you guys would know, is not cancer, is not road accidents, it's suicide. And all the studies point to isolation. Every single study you read, isolation, whether it's physical, mental, could be spiritual. Um, so this is the anecdote. And Jesus gave it to us. It, it's He chose the 12, they had no mobile phones, no Google Maps, no Uber. <laughs> Go out, go. Two by two. That's it. Not alone. Not alone. Yeah. Two by two. Yeah. Amen. And one of the one of the phrases our Lord uses, and it was a beautiful phrase of John Paul II, is be not afraid. And that's the name of the men's conference that you held for the first time last year. It's happening again this year. Do you want to talk to us a, bit, a little bit about that? It's yeah. Genesis and what's going on with it. Yes, yeah, Saturday, September 21. That's the date. Um, I hope many of you can come. So, yeah, be not afraid. This is the second annual one at St. Mary's Cathedral Hall, and we utilize the cathedral itself. So, the cathedral is a place of pilgrimage. Um, that's important to remember. Your time getting there is not wasted, it's, it's efficacious, just as efficacious as going to Lords of Fatima. It's the national shrine, the mother shrine of this great southern land. And, um, named in honour of Our Lady and our patroness, Mary Help of Christians. And it's the site of the first Catholic chapel in the country. I think that's really important to know because when you share the history, then we know where we're going. Um, so Saturday, September 21, this is for men. It's a one day. We call it a tradies day. You come in in the morning, 7 o'clock, you'll get fed. Um, 3.30, we're done. But we're going to be talking about the seven deadly sins, which is important to be aware of but also the opposing virtue, but also practical tips of how you can grow in virtue and also to identify the deadly sins in your life. Um, so I hope as many men as possible can come. We're going to, over the next few weeks, share the details. Father Ben will be there as MC. It's going to be a great day. Many priests be there available for confession, for a chat, for spiritual direction, a number of presenters um good food good company it's going to be amazing I'm, I'm super excited and if it's a tell us why do you think it's important to have on the calendar a day like this as opposed to for example a talk you might attend one evening for 45 minutes why is the day and the location i think you've spoken to that but why is that important to, to lock out a day all right, you don't have to play 18 holes of golf today. You don't have to do this or that. Be intentional and come to a day like that. Why is a day important? Yeah, so it's it's obviously our greatest gift is time. Um, and give your time. If you give your time, the Lord will bless bless you and your intention. So, But what this allows us, as opposed to having one speaker, we are going to have nine different speakers. We're going to have a testimony um, different priests and some laymen share about each deadly sin and the opposing virtue. So you're really going to get this richness. And I, I like to say the true, you know, the word diversity has been so hacked in today's world. The true diversity of the Catholic Church, the universality, you're going to hear from other priests that you you most probably wouldn't normally you know, come across or have the chance to to speak to or hear from, but on this day you will, and you'll be rich, enriched by that, and you'll be mingling with other men from other parish communities that you normally can't be with, and that's understandable. But what this does is gets you out of your little hubs of communities. Come here, get nourished, nourished, renewed. Know that you're not alone. You'll never walk alone, and you go back home. A better man and also with some tools to know how to plug in at any point in time if you're feeling alone really really important 
And how many, what's your great hope for the day? What's our capacity going to be like? What are we looking for? I'm going to say hundreds at this stage when the registration link comes out. <laughs> <Yeah>. Register. Um, <laughs> but there's going to be room for hundreds and, and all the details will be out yeah. very, very soon. And we at Against the Grain will do everything that we can do to help assist and promote this very special yeah. day. Um, it's important to be intentional. September 21, we're giving you months. You can clear your diaries. It's possible. No one can say they didn't know about it. We're going to help you promote it and we keep it in our prayers, the great initiatives um, that the ministry, what's the name of the ministry? Maximus Men's Ministry Network. How'd you come up with yes. that? Well, I inherited that. You inherited Maximus. Maximus. Yeah, um, climbing the mountain, Maximus. There's also a St. Maximus, the confessor. Yes. Um, and you can read his letters, go online for free. So there you go. And um, Maximus Men's Ministry um, encompasses everything we've been talking about, so it's going to be promoted through that. Absolutely. What are your... You, do you utilize social media? How do you get it all out there? Yeah, we're on Facebook. We're on Instagram. Um, there's also a web page um, within, if you just Google Sydney Catholic Maximus. Let's do this now. Vitsi, you get to do it. Do this with us. <laughs> there we go. It's all happening. We're going to put all it's the all details below. there. It's all below. It's and all also below. we have a monthly e-newsletter, so you can subscribe to that via that page. Um, and thank you because you've been a supporter of us. In the newsletter, you've promoted Against the Grain, the podcast. So it's always great to collaborate. Absolutely. And we it's thank great you for, for your promotion of, of our product. So we hope we're doing our little part as well, which is good. Awesome. Can I put one final call out there? If, if we're Put that call Please. out there, mate. You Please. Go for it. So um, this is now specific, and this is something that's certainly come to me in prayer, um, and it's in relation to the first five Saturday devotion and Saturday's – uh, Our Lady's Day. Um, and the call is this, in link to the Men's Rosary Crusade. So on the first Saturday of every month, we go out in public to pray. And the reason why it's in public is because many of those passers-by, people walking by, haven't heard the good news in the Scripture. And we know that Scripture, uh, the Rosary has the Scripture on the beads. And so many people stop, listen, watch they google because they hear what we're saying they see the sign of our lady of fatima and but they never would step foot in our churches and we know this has now spread to some 50 nations in hundreds of cities or towns if not thousands on every first saturday of the month but why 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 is this important because men are doers and this is approved by the church and Our Lady doesn't beat around the bush. She makes it very simple. If we want to pull out those thorns, those splinters by un ungrateful men that are putting that in Our Lady's heart by their actions, there's only one way we can pull those out and it's by the First Saturday Devotion. There is no other way. I don't know why. You can have it out with God. <laughs> But that's the message. Uh, people have asked me why. I don't know. But I think it's important to put that out there because a lot of men have shared with me or asked, what can I do? I said, better than any petitions. Look at it, the Battle of Lepanto. Uh, look at the power of our rosary. This is real. This is not some hypothetical that if you want to be part of Our Lady's army to pull out those thorns of ungrateful men, not just in our city, in the whole country, in all the world, and to pray for peace and the triumph of the Immaculate Heart, come along. But this is the call to Australia men, that on the first Saturday of each month, at every Catholic cathedral in this nation, that we have men gather. I know men are gathering all over, and I'm just sharing this message. This is a place that you can gather to pray and pull out those thorns of Our Lady's hearts. And then after, catch up for a coffee, fraternity. There's many great blessings. So I just want to put that out there. There's going to be more info um, with this in the near future. Wonderful. Um, but rise up, men of Australia. It's good news. Amen. And to any women listening, if you know any men <laughs> who will benefit from, uh, from this ministry, 
please, please reach out to them um, and get them on board. Uh, we all know that, you know, forced um, <laughs> forced catechesis is one of the best ways to get <laughs> Love it. to get people into <laughs> into the faith. Um, but it may, you know they're better for it. So, uh, is there an age limit at all for these sorts of things? On well, some like for certain events, it's eighteen plus. But certainly for the um, men's rosary crusade, all men and sons are encouraged to to join us. Beautiful. It's a beautiful sight to behold. Finishing up mass at St Mary's Cathedral and then walking out onto that forecourt and seeing a Vitsa and the Men's Rosary Crusade setting up to begin and a great public witness and we can get more and more all the time to the first Saturday of the month just for the sake of those that live in Sydney at St Mary's Cathedral. What time does that begin? At 1pm we have Mass in the Cathedral at 12. We have confession available beforehand from 11. Um, so get the trifecta, confession, holy mass, and then pray the rosary. Amazing. Yeah. And that's the way I think we're really starting to see now a spiritual revival um, in our great land. And that's the thing. For too long, very sadly, people were neglecting the spiritual. And it was all about our own efforts and our own um, energies. And I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. But without prayer, it's nothing. Without prayer, it's nothing. So we need more prayer. Um, and the rosary is a great way to do that because Our Lady promises us what comes through the rosary. So it's an amazing thing that you're doing. So everyone at home, pick up your rosary beads and pray. <laughs> pray, pray, and pray. That's what we need. Okay. Amen. Evitsa, we're going to give you the Sharpie. Anthony's <laughs> going to grab you the canvas. I'm going to ask you to sign and maybe put a word of encouragement or even maybe a favourite scripture verse. Be not afraid. I like it. God bless you, mate. This is why it's good to have the spiritual son around. He's always prompting me for the things that I forget. When I remember. <laughs> <laughs> when he remembers. <laughs> Ivica, thank you so much for Thanks being for with us me. here on the Against the Grain podcast. We wish you all the best. We're praying for you and your beautiful family. Um, and we pray that the ministry continues to flourish. And if you ever need anything, you've always got a friend in us on Against the Grain. Thank you. Thanks, guys. I second that. <laughs> Amazing. Ditto. Good stuff. <laughs> well, how about we've been talking about her a bit, so let's finish by praying and asking Our Lady to um, to bring our prayers and petitions to her Son's most sacred heart. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy, Holy Mary, Mary Mother, Mother of God, God pray, pray for, for us sinners, sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Our Lady, help of Christians, pray, pray for us. us. The Lord be with you. And, and with your spirit. spirit. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Great show, everybody. Great mm. show. Remember our Lord Jesus Christ says, you are the salt of the earth. What good is salt if it loses its taste? So stay salty. <laughs> and don't be afraid to go against the grain. God bless. Yeah.